Hello and welcome to the RCSI My Health series supported by Fleming Medical. I am Professor Anne Hickey and today we're going to be discussing the topic of stroke, stroke prevention and new developments in treatments and rehabilitation. The My Health series explores a wide range of areas in health and well-being and brings together some of the leading healthcare experts in these fields with the goal of empowering people with the knowledge to make informed decisions about their own health and well-being. Today I am joined by Mr. Martin Fahey, who is a patient representative and has experienced a stroke. And Martin is a patient representative on a number of uh, research studies that we're doing in RCSI, particularly the iPaster study. We're also joined by Professor Francis Horgan, a professor in the School of Physiotherapy in RCSI University of Medicine and Health Sciences. And Francis leads on a number of research projects in the area of stroke rehabilitation. And finally, we're joined by Professor David Williams, Professor of Stroke Medicine at RCSI University of Medicine and Health Sciences and a stroke physician at Beaumont Hospital. And David leads on a number of stroke projects, particularly around the area of acute stroke care and stroke care pathways. Welcome to the RCSI My Health series. We received lots of questions um, for our panel today and while we won't be able to answer all of them individually, we will address the themes that were raised in those questions. So we'll be looking at stroke prevention, um, the stroke patient journey, um, in ho hospital care, after hospital care, um, and then living well with stroke. We're going to start by looking at the area of prevention and particularly looking at risk factors. So we know that one of the biggest risk factors for stroke is age and that the older a person is, the greater the risk they have of having a stroke. Um, but David, maybe I'd just ask you, what are additional risk factors for stroke um, and how do they manifest? Thanks, Anne. And, and you mentioned there are modifiable and non-modifiable risk factors for stroke. The non-modifiable ones are the ones you included, such as age and gender. But the modifiable risk factors for stroke include high blood pressure, hypercholesterolemia or high uh, lipid levels, uh, diabetes and smoking. Smoking is a significant risk factor for, uh, for stroke. And then also there's another condition called atrial fibrillation and irregularity in the heart rate, which is another significant risk factor, particularly as we get older. The prevalence of atrial fibrillation is as high as 18% in patients who are aged over 80 years of age. So that's a significant modifiable risk factor that we can treat with uh, anticoagulants or blood thinners that can prevent uh, a major stroke. Okay, and how might somebody know they have atrial fibrillation? So um, there's a campaign which has been led by the Irish Heart Foundation at the moment about feel your pulse. So if you take your pulse and you find that it's irregular, you're recommended that you should go to your GP or healthcare provider to see if you've got an irregularity that, that, that will confirm that irregularity of the heart rate by doing an ECG, for example. Okay, great, thank you. Francis, are there other things that people can do or actions they can take to prevent stroke? A healthy lifestyle is very important, maintaining a healthy weight, taking regular exercise, not smoking, cutting out on alcohol, visiting your GP regularly to get your blood pressure and your bloods checked, um, reducing stress in your life as well. So these very much come under the umbrella of um, lifestyle medicine. Okay. Thank you, Francis. And maybe just to say to our listeners and viewers that lifestyle medicine is uh, the topic of another My Health lecture, and it's something that you could watch if you're interested. Um, Francis, I might come back to you just to ask about warning signs in relation to stroke. So are there specific warning signs that would alert somebody to the fact that either they were having a stroke themselves or that they're witnessing somebody having a stroke? Yeah, this is very important. Um, the key thing about the warning signs for stroke is that they're sudden, it's of sudden onset. And this is very much linked to the FAST campaign. And F stands for face, so somebody might notice that they have a, a weakness or an asymmetry in the muscles of their face. They might notice that their arm is weak, that's the A. They might have difficulty speaking, that's the S for speech. And the T is about the time, time to call 999, because Calling 999, stroke is a medical emergency. It happens suddenly, the warning signs are sudden. It's very important that the call is made because that allows us to preserve brain cells and minimize the damage of the stroke. Okay, great. And we're actually going to watch a video now on the uh, FAST advert so that people can see what's involved. My name is Justin and I'm a paramedic. In this job, we are required to act fast every single day. When someone has a stroke, minutes matter because two million brain cells die every minute after a stroke. So it's important to know the fast signs. F for face, has it fallen on one side? 
A for arms, can they both be held up? S for speech, is it slurred? And T for time, it's time to call 112 or 999 fast. The faster you get our help, the more of the person you save. Remember, when stroke strikes, act fast. If someone has any one of these symptoms, call 112 or 999 immediately. So it's interesting, Francis, because we've done research here in RCSI looking at um, the general public and looking at their awareness of stroke warning signs. And we know that it's not terribly good, that people are not that aware, but particularly older people uh, tend to have the poorest awareness of stroke warning signs. And I suppose, ironically, um, older people are more at risk for stroke. So it, that's an important message, I think, for everybody to understand. Um, David, I might come to you just to maybe tell us why it's so important that people recognise the warning signs for stroke and then, you know, what is the appropriate action? Yes, the important thing about to realise about stroke is that uh, time is of the essence because for every minute we don't treat a stroke, we lose approximately 2 million brain cells. And for every minute saved, we restore one week of healthy living to a patient. So time is of the importance. And the treatments that we have are very much time dependent. So the sooner we can treat a stroke, the better the outcome for the patient. So we, we have this mantra of time is brain. So important to get the, the patient to the hospital where they can be assessed urgently and the appropriate treatments can be instituted as soon as possible. Okay, great, thank you. And Martin, I might come to you now, so we're delighted to have you here with us um, today. And um, maybe you could share with our viewers and listeners your experience of stroke. So what happened when you had your stroke? Sure, so it's very interesting listening to Francis talk about the warning signs. So what happened to me was um, I had a stroke um, January the 5th, 2019, nearly five years ago. In the lead up to the stroke, I'd been leading a very unhealthy lifestyle. I'd become quite overweight, um, lack of exercise, uh, very much stressed out. I was trying to work two jobs um, and things just kind of got on top of me. So um, I was also very addicted to energy drinks, um, which was, I think, possibly a factor in my stroke as well, and just overdoing things in general. So what happened was on a Saturday afternoon at 1 p.m., I was in the local shopping centre, which is only about five minutes walk from my house, and I started to feel very lightheaded. So um, I had a drink of water, sat down uh, with a friend I knew from the shopping centre who was working there. And after about 15 minutes, I stood up and started to make my way home and more or less staggered home. I kind of, at the time, although I knew a little bit about a stroke and the fast campaign, I didn't really suspect it was a stroke. I thought it was just an episode of exhaustion or a little turn I was having. So I got home, I staggered home, not in great shape. But during the afternoon, I, I seemed to pick up a bit. I kind of um, felt better, even had a little dinner. Um, at that stage, my family members left to head away for a few hours. I was on my own in the house. So about 5 p.m., I went for a lie down in bed. I was in the very top of the house in a converted bedroom, very steep stairs to get up. When I woke up around seven o'clock, I realized I could not get out of bed. My whole left side was kind of immobile um, and I realized some, something was up. Um, I very silly, stupidly um, tried to get out of bed, staggered down the stairs, went into the shower, tried to have a shower, wasted an hour at least, went back to bed and thought I'd try and sleep it off. And then um, about uh, maybe an hour later, uh, couldn't sleep, I knew kind of something was up, went on the phone and Googled stroke, kind of was copying on at that stage, it might have been a stroke, and started to suspect I was having a stroke. Um, then I rang my wife, who was not available on the phone. Luckily, my sister-in-law answered, and I stammered. I couldn't get a, 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 a concise word out, and that's when it really hit me. I'm definitely having a stroke. So she realised, and um, my wife came over and drove me to hospital. We probably should have called a 99 ambulance straight away, but it was quite quick. We got to hospital fairly quick. And luckily, um, when I was dropped off at the door, I, I kind of staggered into the emergency department, it was a busy Saturday night, but luckily the receptionist uh, uh, spotted me straight away and copped on I was having a stroke and straight away I was kind of um, given priority and brought straight in to the back area and doctors assessed me and um, from there I had a CAT scan and spent the night in hospital and then the, the process started for the next few weeks in hospital to okay. care. So you were admitted then after the CAT scan you were yeah. admitted to hospital and you were there? for a period of some weeks? Yeah, so I was there uh, four and a half, nearly five weeks. Um, uh, I was very lucky, the 
care and attention was brilliant. Um, it's quite overwhelming though, as a stroke patient, mm -hmm. when you have your stroke, your physical disability and your, what we call brain fog, um, which makes concentration and thinking very difficult. So it can be quite overwhelming. Um, you get a lot of care. You've got your stroke nurses, your dietitian, your speech therapist, um, the occupational therapist, the physio, and so on, the social worker. Um, so it's quite overwhelming and the care is absolutely brilliant, but at times it's, it's, it's maybe not coordinated perfectly because I remember one time it was a queue of three different consultants waiting to see me um, and they're on the second or third day and I'm there kind of trying to, trying to think straight. Um, and did you find that it was hard to retain information? There was a lot of information coming as well. Uh, yeah, very much so. And that's something that needs to be kind of improved probably to bear in mind that the patient um, can't absorb that much information at the time and maybe things need to be repeated. Um, I did get a nice pack of information leaflets, but it wasn't really kind of gone into in detail with me about services available yeah. for when I went home. Yeah. Um, I was probably in hospital quite a long time because they couldn't diagnose precisely what triggered the stroke. In the end, it was put down to lifestyle. I think it was quite fortunate because they did a raft of tests, heart test, um, they tested multiple sclerosis, many different tests for me, mm -hmm. um, but couldn't pinpoint what had triggered the stroke. So it was put down to, to lifestyle, which I think is correct. Something, I just was overdoing things and exhaustion triggered it. Yeah, um, which is very important. I think that people understand the importance of lifestyle. Sure, absolutely, yeah. 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 Thank you, Martin. So I, I might go to you, David, just to ask you maybe to tell us a bit more about the acute stroke care pathways. So when a person ideally comes to hospital by ambulance into the A&E department, what happens then? Yes, there's a rapid assessment of the patient. The patient is initially brought to the accident emergency department. A very short history is taken. The patient is brought to the CT scan. And the reason for doing a CT scan and a CT angiogram is to make sure that the patient doesn't have a hemorrhage because that's the less uh, common cause of stroke and it's unfortunately we can't give uh, there's less treatments that we can offer for that form of stroke. The major form of stroke is um, a, a stroke caused by a clot in a major artery in the brain and we've two ways to treat that. One is by giving a thrombolytic agent, which, is, which dissolves the clot. And the other treatment, which has only been, ava been available since 2015, is thrombectomy, which removes the clot. And we know that patients get better quicker if we can treat quickly. Um, thrombectomy is a, is a service that we have available in two hospitals in the country, in Beaumont Hospital, uh, where I work, and also in Cork University Hospital. Mm -hmm. This treatment is not available in uh, widespread in the UK and other parts of Europe. So we're very fortunate to be able to tr provide this treatment to uh, our patients in Ireland. Yes, and so patients from all over Ireland can be brought to those centres to That's have a right. thrombectomy. And again, it's rapid transportation where the patients are brought from anywhere within the country. They're seen at a local uh, hospital and then they're brought to either Beaumont or Cork University Hospital for thrombectomy treatment. And there's a kind of a fast track for there people is. in then? Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. So I think we have uh, some footage of a thrombectomy um, and you're going to maybe talk us through it, David. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank yes. you. So this is an illustration of what uh, happens during a thrombectomy. This is performed by a neuroradiologist at either Beaumont Hospital or in Cork University Hospital in Ireland. And uh, as you can see here, there's a blood clot which is obstructing a major artery. Now there's two ways that we can get rid of this blood clot. Uh, one is by thrombolysis or clot uh, dissolving medication or else through a thrombectomy. And what happens is a catheter is fed up through the major artery in the groin up into the brain and uh, this is what we call a, a stent retriever has been deployed and you can see it catches the, the clot it's a very highly skilled procedure and it pulls the clot out and you can imagine when that uh, blood clot is removed and uh, the blood flow going back to the area of the brain that has been uh, damaged and hopefully restores blood flow and we know that the patient makes an excellent recovery after this procedure again time is brain the sooner we perform the thrombectomy the, uh, the better the outcome for the patient
And that actually was my next question. Is there a kind of a, a, a recommended time window within which this procedure should happen, just to maybe emphasize the importance of time as brain? So the evidence for thrombectomy has gone from six hours initially up to 12 hours and up to 24 hours. But we know now with even more detailed um, uh, scanning of the brain that patients may still benefit at over 24 hours. So the window for treatment for thrombectomy is ever expanding at the moment. So that's why I would say always uh, time is brain. The sooner the patient presents to uh, the hospital, the better the outcome for the patient. Okay, so maybe with longer time periods, the outcome wouldn't be as good. That's correct, yeah. yeah. That's right. Okay, yeah. okay. Um, thank you. Uh, Francis, maybe from a rehabilitation perspective, if you could tell us what the inpatient journey might be like, and Martin has alluded to that, but what might they expect from a rehabilitation point of view in hospital? Mm -hmm. So I suppose some of that starts in the emergency department when the patient is there and the nursing staff and doctors can do a swallow screen. The patient then moves up to the stroke unit. The stroke unit is where we have a very specialised multidisciplinary team with doctors, nurses, therapists, physiotherapists, occupational therapists, speech and language therapists. The patient is monitored in the stroke unit. That's the early stage of rehabilitation. Um, an important starting point is the assessment because many patients differ in terms of how the stroke has affected them. So for some, for example, they may have weakness in their arm or leg. They could have difficulty with their communication, um, their talking, their swallow. Um, so the early assessments by the physiotherapist then lead to the treatment planning and then progressing the rehabilitation. The patients can move out of the stroke unit then into the stroke rehabilitation unit and really we're setting goals to try and restore any of the functions that they've lost, any of the movements that they're having difficulty with, weakness of the arm, weakness of the leg, balance and walking. Okay, yeah, and then similarly with speech and language therapy and occupational therapy, they would be doing... Exactly, like so that. the speech and language therapist would, would be looking at both um, swallow and communication. The occupational therapist would be looking at, at activities of daily living and self-care. And th those team members would be meeting every week with the doctors and nurses to, to, to discuss progress at the multidisciplinary team meeting because ultimately they're planning for discharge um, from the hospital. And um, in some cases, then rehabilitation needs to continue after the hospital phase. OK, and then there is a, a new initiative, well, a relatively new initiative that's growing um, in Ireland around early support of discharge. So maybe if you could tell us a little bit about that. So we're very fortunate in Ireland. There's been um, a significant investment in early support of discharge. We have 12 early support of discharge teams. This is when the patient can leave hospital a little bit early and they can go home and their rehabilitation continues in their home. So the physiotherapist, the occupational therapist, the, the nurse, the social worker, the therapy assistant, the team comes out to continue their rehabilitation at home. Now there are some criteria, you know, they need to be able to transfer and, and um, independently to be able to avail of early support of discharge. And that generally continues for eight to, eight to 10 weeks. And so we have 12 of those teams and there's very positive feedback. And we're hoping that in the future there will be more investment in teams as the stroke strategy is rolled out. Okay, um, that's great. I suppose importantly, maybe just to mention to the listeners and viewers that th there are areas of rehabilitation that are less well developed particularly in the area of psychology, so mood and cognition are areas that, that tend not to get rehabilitated and that's something that we're actively um, researching in RCSI at the moment. Um, Martin, I might turn to you now because I know you have experienced early support of discharge. Um, so maybe if you tell us a bit about um, what that was like. Sure, so as I mentioned, I was in the hospital about four and a half weeks. Um, my left side was, was affected and at start, at start, I could barely move. My thumb was all the movement I had. Gradually, things improved. My speech came back very quickly, and the speech therapist um, gave, uh, saw me a couple of times. I came back quickly, and um, gradually, over the four weeks, um, my movement gradually improved slowly. I went to the gym on a daily basis, and the occupational therapist used, used to visit me as well. So after about a four-week mark, um, they, I was offered the chance to of early support discharge. Um, it was a cancellation, I believe, and I was asked, would I would I be interested to avail of it? Because at my age, in the early 50s, was the perfect age for somebody for early support discharge. My stroke was kind of, I suppose, medium level of stroke. It was quite severe, but at my age, and uh, it was a good chance of a, a reasonably good recovery. So um, I jumped at the chance because obviously going to a home situation is much better after being stuck in hospital for four weeks. Um, and I found the whole experience absolutely wonderful. Um, the way it worked for me was after I came home, 
the physio who was appointed to me, she visited me several times over about a three to four week period. Um, the occupational therapist also called out to me several times as well. Um, and then also, even after the visits ended, I was able to go into the hospital gym, meet the physio and do some exercises in there. And also I was lucky enough to get a few appointments for the hospital, a uh, special pool they have for rehab in Tala Hospital. I was able to use, utilize that a couple of times as well. Um, and when the physio visited me on the first occasion, we managed to walk as far as the end of my driveway. By the time she finished me several weeks later, I was able to walk to the park um, quite a distance away. So the improvements were much more rapid once I came home than I perceived them to be in the hospital. So I really felt it progressed well. Um, so um, following from that, I'd um, generally, I, I after the early sport discharge, I was quite proactive in the options available to me subsequently. The physio had recommended an Exwell physio physical programme, which I attended for uh, several months, twice a week, which is very, very good. It's for cardiac and stroke patients, um, and they have excellent programmes. It was pre-COVID, so I was there in person uh, at the programmes. Um, I also was in the local, sorry, in the local stroke group uh, me meeting. Um, I was the youngest there, which was, was interesting, um, but I used to go along there every Tuesday. Really, really good way to have a break and socialise and talk to people who'd been through a stroke experience. Um, the Irish Heart Foundation have a brilliant Facebook group, Life After Stroke, and I got valuable information there from the um, counsellors advising and then the, the stroke patients inputting their, their, their experiences and so on. You get a great kind of um, empathy with people um, and, and relate to people who've had the same experience because one of the things uh, people don't realise about strokes often is that they see you physically improving, but they don't understand the, the brain fog because obviously they don't mm -hmm. experience it. So my, my biggest problem, once my mobility improved, was the brain fog ongoing. That was a major problem for me um, over months and e even years. Yeah, and I, I was going to ask actually if, if there's anything that you didn't expect. So anything that was sort of hidden while you were in hospital and then you realised was an issue when you came home. And maybe that sort of brain fog was part of it. Yeah, that was a major part of it because I had been kind of expecting that would kind of go away or improve. Um, and it has improved. Um, it still is improving, I think, four and a half years later. But definitely that was a big factor for me. And because of that, I think my concentration was very badly affected. So I couldn't read two pages of a book, no concentration. I couldn't watch uh, half an hour of TV or Netflix or whatever just found I did not have the concentration um, and felt a bit lost mentally, mentally, mental health wise, I felt very lost. Whereas physically everybody would say, oh, Martin, look, you're, you're getting better every time they saw me. But behind the mask, if you like, mentally I was struggling because of the brain fog and what that meant in relation to things like concentration. And, so, and was fatigue an element of that brain fog as well that you, yeah, you got tired? Yeah, tiredness and e even to this day, my big problem at the moment is exhaustion in the evenings. When I finish work in the evenings, I find that I generally am quite exhausted and literally want to go to bed. I have lack of energy, motivation to do things. Whereas in the morning, it's, it's the best time of the day for me. I'm, I'm full of energy, take the dog for a walk, um, do a good day's work. But um, in the early days, before I went back to work especially, that was a big, big problem, just getting motivated. And that can stop you as well. Physical activity is very, very important for stroke patients. And I was relatively young for a stroke. So I was kind of motivated, self-motivated. But I can imagine for older people, very, very hard to get the motivation, especially with the mental effect of, of brain fog. And to understand it's so important to push yourself um, to get those exercises doing, because that's really what helps you a lot, I'm sure, in your recovery. Yeah. OK, uh, thank you, Martin. Um, I'm, maybe just to ask Francis and David, just for that period after the patient goes home and after, we'll say, early support of discharge has finished, what is the community support for people with stroke like? That can be sometimes a challenging time because it can be difficult to navigate the services. Um, sometimes patients can access community services, but the Irish Heart Foundation has a, you know, a, a wide range of services that they have developed. They have a specific um, discharge support service called Connect. They have, um, as Martin mentioned, the Facebook group, the Young Stroke Survivor group peer-to-peer -peer support groups. They have um, some psychology um, support as well. 
Um, so I think that's an area that there will be need to be future improvements, but you know, um, sometimes progress is slow. But as Martin mentioned, sometimes there can be a little bit of a void maybe after the early support of discharge and people feel that they need to avail of more. And again, they can engage with the physiotherapist again or the services in the hospital if they're having a checkup and look at those services in the community. Martin has mentioned the physical activity and the exercise, which is very important to stay well and to stay active mm -hmm. after your stroke. Yes. I might add, Anne, is that often people, uh, patients feel as if they're falling off a cliff when they leave hospital. Yes. It's a complete new adjustment that they need to undertake when they go home. And this is a significant psychological adjustment. And we know that, unfortunately, psychological services in the community are very under-resourced. So that would be a, a big plea for me in terms of funding would be for more psychological services in the community to support yes. our stroke uh, patients when they go home. Yeah, and maybe just to ask you, Martin, then, how did you find out about the services in the community? Did somebody tell you about them or did you have to go looking for them yourself? Sure. So in the hospital, I was given a pack with various um, things like the Headway. Uh, I didn't use Headway, but Headway, the Facebook group. Um, that's how I found out about services like that. I think the Xwell, there was a little cheat about that as well. Um, but I would say the, the physio, the early support discharge, she actually kind of alerted me to a lot of, of the options. And the occupational therapist uh, was good enough to put me down for Bagot Street Hospital, which had a, a stroke rehab unit there at the time. I think they've moved to Klansky now. Yeah. Um, she put me down on that and I had to wait about 12 weeks, which ended up tying in very nicely to the structure of going back to work. The social work in hospital also was brilliant. She liaised with my employer and um, advised me about what options I had medically. Um, so I had, to, But at the same time, I would say um, I was quite proactive, like I, I I know a lot of people, older people especially, maybe are not proactive. I was self-motivated, young children, early 50s, so relatively young for stroke. So I was very self-motivated. So I did do, I was quite proactive myself. Um, so it was a combination of that. And, and I did find out several services myself as well. Um, so okay. yeah. And so you were referred to Bagot Street, which has now moved to Klonski. Yeah. Um, and is that where you started to prepare then to go back to work? Yeah, so um, once I got into the programme, I had several visits there, did things like cognitive tests, um, just general chats, how I felt about going back to work. Um, and what was very good was they, rather than me jumping in, working the deep end, going back full time, they highly recommended I do the gradual, kind of go back to work in a gradual basis. My job was work from home, which was also very useful. I didn't have to transport as you were getting into, into work. Mm -hmm. So um, my employer was very helpful. They put no pressure on me while I was recovering. I was very lucky. I'm sure other people, if they were self-employed or in certain companies, they wouldn't have the same support, but I was very lucky. They were very patient with me. And then as advised me back, so I gradually worked my way into the job, starting off a day a week and a couple of hours a day. And after about a month, six weeks, I was able to go back to, to full time working. And um, that was about six months after my stroke when I went back to work. OK, so that was that was great. Yeah. yeah. Um, OK, so I, I might just ask the panel, in terms of living well after stroke, how would you say, it, what, how would you go about that? What is the best thing that you could do to live well after a stroke? Um, the word I would use is hope and, and optimism. Obviously, your lifestyle has to change. Well, it, it, it automatically will change because of your physical issues and, and mental health issues. But the important thing is to be positive and have hope and be optimistic. And again, as I mentioned earlier, people can see you physically improving, but they don't realize behind in, in your brain fog, you're main, be struggling mentally. Yeah. Um, so it's very important for your family, um, your carers, the doctor and um, consultants to try and feed um, positive vibes from them, if, if you understand what I mean. Mm -hmm. I would say people are reluctant to tell you, you said to somebody, will I be okay in six months time? People understandably aren't going to say you're going to be running around the field because they don't know. Nobody knows how you're going to recover. But I do think people need to be uh, give a good optimistic feeling to the patient um, as they're recovering, especially having left hospital where they're kind of out of the hospital loop, if you like. It's very important and, and the, the carers and family members that they, they get um, good help as well to help the patient, the yeah. survivor, stroke survivor to kind of recover in a positive way because it's a very important part of your recovery, especially for older people, I think, again, because they really need positivity to, to motivate them to, to change their lifestyle and to adapt 
the new situation because it, it's a total change of your lifestyle and how you live. Whether it's even a minor stroke to a serious stroke, your whole life is changed in, in one fell swoop. Yes, yeah, very quickly. And I think to have patience as well. So as you were saying, your speech recovered quickly. Yeah. Your physical function quite quickly. But then maybe the brain fog more slowly and you still can see improvements in, in the fatigue that you feel and in the, the concentration sure. issues. Yeah, the have. brain fog yeah. is four and a half years later. I, it's definitely still improving. I would have said last year was like 80 percent. Now it's say like 90 percent. Um, in fact, during the daytime, it's probably I wouldn't hardly notice it anymore. Mm -hmm. It only kind of kicks in with the tiredness and exhaustion in the evening that I still have a bit of a problem with that. And maybe sleeping patterns can be better as well. Probably doesn't help either. But yeah, but still improving. And like, what I would say to people is, you know, I'm nearly five years after my stroke, and I feel I'm still improving both physically and mentally every day, which is really positive. That's, That's the message I would try and give out yeah. to people. Okay. Um, in terms of living well with stroke, maybe Francis, um, I might come to you then as well. Yeah, that's very, I just want to add to what Martin says, because that recovery is very varied for everybody and, you know, it can last up to years. So I think that's a very important message about being, staying positive, staying well, think about the different lifestyle factors that you can modify to have a healthier lifestyle after your stroke. Build in movement. Movement is so important. Movement and exercise and staying well. There are so many benefits of movement and exercise, and that is all very beneficial for the movement recovery because all of that practice and repetition helps the person to relearn the movements that they may have lost. Another thing I would say is ensure that you ask questions and you get as much information as you can. Look at all the different resources and the information that are there. Often it's a family member that can help, help you with that if, if you're not able to find that information yourself. Yeah, okay, thanks Francis. David, is there anything you want to well, add? Well, just to that? add, and Martin is a great example of how important it is to have a positive outlook after stroke. It, stroke should not define the, the, the patient, and that's so important uh, going forward. But also there will be risk factors that need to be addressed for ongoing risk factors for stroke. So if the patient has, for example, atrial fibrillation, they need to take anticoagulants, mm -hmm. and it's important to, to, to take their medications. If they've got blood high blood pressure, they need to treat the high blood pressure. Mm -hmm. If they've got diabetes that needs to be managed as well and obviously stopping smoking all those important around lifestyle changes that the patient would have made uh, on discharge yeah. they're very important but again just to emphasize the positive outlook is, is so important yes yeah yeah absolutely um, and I might just add I suppose and um, just to let people know that at a national level there is data being collected all the time through the Irish National Audit of Stroke and so there is a focus on quality improvement at hospital level and at rehabilitation and recovery level all the time. So, so I think that's also a very positive message. Um, we, we were maybe going to talk a little bit about uh, some research in RCSI. So um, there are a number of projects ongoing and one of them is around stroke care pathways. I don't know if you'd like to say a little bit about that research. Mm -hmm. So the Stroke Care Pathways project is the iPaster project, improving pathways of stroke care and rehabilitation. And really the idea for this project came from people who had had a stroke because they told us about their experiences of that falling off a cliff feeling when they finish rehabilitation, navigating the services, the challenges that they have around living well after stroke. So we have some PhD scholars who are researching these questions. We also have another project we'll be starting in the next few weeks, which is called CLASP, which is co-designing life after stroke pathways, mm -hmm. because that is very important. And it's important that we know where are the gaps, where can we improve, what are the unmet needs, maybe the invisible aspects of stroke that need more attention, more access to psychology, so that we can set everybody up for success and ensuring that they fulfil all their um, aspirations for resuming their life after stroke. Yeah, and um, David, some research that I know you're leading out on. Yes, yeah, so one of the, the research projects that we're looking at is trying to reduce the barriers to access to the acute services for patients who've suffered a stroke. So you can imagine there's a number of steps that a patient needs to go through from the time that they've had their stroke at home to coming into the hospital, to getting the CT scan, to getting the treatment. So what we're looking at now is trying to reduce uh, the times that patients will experience so that they get their treatment as soon as they can and ultimately they'll get a better outcome. Okay. Yeah, so th that's just a flavour of some of the ongoing projects that are happening here in RCSI um, in particular. 
So we're going to finish up with some take-home messages. So I suppose just the key take-home message for those watching or listening today. And I might start with you, Francis. if that's OK? Yeah, I think recovery is very varied and very individualised. So that's very important. Um, set goals. Um, think about accessing treatment, um, seeking out that treatment and staying positive and really lots of practice because we know we have to practice those movements thousands of times to relearn the movement. So lots of opportunities for building in movement into your daily life. OK, thanks. And David, maybe a take home message from you. Um, my my take home message would be time is brain and act fast. Don't ignore the symptoms of stroke. Often patients don't realize that they're suffering a stroke. There's no pain. So patients often delay presentation to hospital. So time is brain. And the sooner you get access to hospital services, uh, the better for outcome in terms of stroke. OK, thank you. Martin, anything that you'd like to leave as a take home message? Um, just in terms of recovery, as I mentioned already, to be positive and baby steps, you're not going to recover quickly in most cases is to just get a sense of Im improvement and um, it just to your lifestyle it's not the end of the world and um, you you can recover and need a very good lifestyle I've been very lucky because my stroke was relatively serious but I've managed to re-establish my, my life I'm, my lifestyle is generally better could still be a bit better but overall I'm, I'm doing fairly well and um, just set goals as I mentioned already and take it day by day and um, don't expect that you're going to be running around the field mm -hmm. or anything like that just gra gradual progress and just think positively and, and you know people will adapt to your situation as well your friends and family they adapt and they they, they have a fair idea and um, what's going on and just just be be kind of positive and friendly to everybody okay. um, and moods can be difficult for a person with, with drugs as well so it's very important to take that into account yourself you're dealing with people that you know you're going to have mood swings because of the effect that it has as well yeah okay thank you martin and maybe for me i would say for everybody in the public and um, to know the warning signs of stroke and to know what to do if they see if either they feel themselves or see somebody else having a stroke that you call an ambulance you don't phone a friend uh, you don't phone your gp you phone an ambulance and get into hospital as quickly as possible so that concludes our discussion for today. Uh, my thanks to our speakers, Martin Fahey, Professor Francis Horgan, Professor David Williams. Um, further details about upcoming episodes of the My Health series can be found on the RCSI website. You can also find the RCSI My Health series episodes across all major podcast platforms. RCSI is committed to improving human health and we are proud to be ranked first in the world for our impact on good health and well-being. From all of us here at the RCSI University of Medicine and Health Sciences, thank you for joining us.